Uh, dear colleagues, dear friends, uh, today uh, as part of our weekly uh, webinars, we are hosting uh, a reputable uh, lecturer and scientist from uh, the Groningen University uh, from the Netherlands. Uh, Dr. Uh, Aga Bayramo is a very renowned uh, scientist. He extensively uh, writes on Caspian Sea, uh, Azerbaijan, Caucasus, uh, the pipelines in the area, and uh, he's a very uh, productive scientist. And actually, uh, we want to uh, thank you for uh, joining us today, for accepting our invitation and uh, giving a seminar uh, in the framework of uh, Eurasia, uh, Eurasian Research Institute. Uh, and uh, today, I think you will be presenting us the environmental side of the uh, Caspian Sea uh, region, uh, more or less, and uh, the recent developments and probably a theoretical uh, framework of how to analyze, how to see, how to read these uh, recent developments uh, in the region. So uh, thanks again and uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much for this uh, comprehensive and very kind introduction. And thank you very much for having me today and uh, giving me a chance to present my uh, work. Uh, first, I want to show uh, outline and uh, uh, we can also do this interactive in case uh, I speak too fast or too complex. Uh, our audience can always ask their questions in between if something is not clear or if something is not um, uh, clearly explained, then I can uh, answer the question. So in between, we can also have Q&A session uh, from the audience if they prefer, because I can imagine that uh, listening online is uh, tiring and uh, difficult sometimes, uh, considering the topic itself and uh, uh, theoretical uh, discussions. So I will uh, start a brief uh, background about uh, my project. And then I will move to geopolitical views on the Caspian Sea region, so uh, to introduce the existing literature, and then my alternative theoretical framework that I used uh, classical functionalism. And I will end uh, my presentation with uh, discussions, my uh, main uh, empirical findings. Uh, this uh, article uh, already published uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, and it is part of my uh, PhD project. It's one of my PhD chapters. In my PhD project, I use classical functionalism. It is mainly used uh, within the European studies to explain technical cooperation and integration uh, between the European countries after the Second World War. And uh, when I look at the Caspian Sea region, uh, I realize that uh, the existing literature constantly uh, describe the region from the geopolitical perspective or geopolitical game. So I thought maybe I can look at the region from a different perspective and opposite, uh, honestly, perspective, because functionalism, I will mention later, uh, uh, highlights the role of non-state actors, uh, financial institutions, and uh, shared uh, issues among the states. So I thought maybe uh, this will challenge the existing literature and provide an alternative view on the uh, regional developments. So for my PhD project, I used uh, three interlinked case studies. One of them is Caspian environmental program that I will present today. Uh, others are uh, Baku Tbilisi Jehan oil pipeline and Southern gas corridor, uh, because these are the three projects, uh, more or less uh, five Caspian countries are part of it, directly, indirectly, based on their uh, financial institutions. So I thought um, I can look at the Caspian Sea region uh, under these case studies. And uh, in my PhD project, I didn't look at uh, only Caspian Sea countries, but I defined the region based on the sea. So I didn't look at Armenia, uh, Kyrgyzstan, or other neighborhood countries. My purpose was to analyze only five Caspian Sea countries, because when we look at the literature, uh, they confuse the region, they either concentrate on Central Asia or South Caucasus, but uh, very few literature explains only Caspian Sea countries, uh, five of their relationship, their history, and their interaction with each other. Because for me, uh, geography is not only territory, but also water boundaries. Uh, 
so my objective uh, in this paper was to, of course, I'll, uh, offer uh, alternative view. And uh, first, I wanted to show that Caspian Sea is not full of conflict and rivalry. Uh, when we look at the literature uh, from the 1990s, we can see mainly uh, competition and conflict among the uh, Caspian littoral states that uh, literature paid more attention. So I tried to show that, well, this is not the full picture, there are also rooms uh, for cooperation. Second aim is to illustrate rule of non-state actors or actors beside uh, and beyond states, such as intergovernmental organizations, non-governmental organizations, companies, lobby groups. So how do uh, these actors play a role? And uh, Another aim is to show the uh, spillover uh, or the interconnection between different uh, issues such as legal status, environmental issues, and also to update the literature about the Caspian environmental program because this program uh, was established in 1995 and after 2002, almost uh, uh, no one wrote about this program and the highlight it is role. So legal status of the Caspian Sea was signed uh, on uh, 12 August 2000. Uh, yes, legal status of the Caspian Sea was signed uh, on 12 August 2018. And here I prepared a timeline uh, about the convention of the legal status, like step by step, what happened. I'm not sure whether our uh, uh, audience can see uh, uh, timeline clearly. If not, uh, you can also check my article, uh, which is available online. I, I also included timeline there as well. So Caspian Sea uh, was divided uh, during the Soviet time between Soviet Union and Iran. And after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, new independent states emerged and uh, uh, although they recognized the previous agreements but they highlighted that uh, these agreements between Soviet Union and Iran didn't include Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan's interest and legal uh, dimension. So they started from uh, two, uh, 1992 uh, new discussion uh, in order to make new agreements and new frameworks which include uh, all the uh, Caspian uh, littoral states, uh, not only uh, Iran and uh, Russia. Well, when we look at the uh, position of five Caspian uh, countries, we can see that uh, they all uh, share different views. That's why it ended up uh, more than 50 meetings and uh, more than 20 years of discussion between them. Uh, Azerbaijan favored more uh, treating the Caspian as a border laid. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Kas uh, Kazakhstan shared similar but also a little bit different view with Azerbaijan uh, to define it as a enclosed sea uh, per the United Nations Convention on the Law, uh, law of the Sea. Uh, here we see Russia and Iran proposed a very different approach. Uh, to the Caspian Sea, and they, they wanted to define it according to condominium, uh, uh, condominium uh, requirements. And Turkmenistan position uh, is quite uh, challenging because it changed because of internal uh, issues. Uh, as you know, Turkmenistan had uh, uh, different uh, presidents during these discussions, and there were presidential changes. And this uh, internal change also influenced Turkmenistan position as well. Occasionally it supported uh, Russia and Iran's view and later on it changed uh, its view uh, from different issues. Uh, when we look at uh, overall the long journey of uh, legal status, we can see that uh, existing literature constantly describe this legal status uh, from a geopolitical perspective. Uh, I did a very um, individual search. So I did a Google search uh, just for Caspian Sea. And uh, when you write a Google uh, Caspian Sea between 1990 and 2020, you can see academic articles, uh, newspapers, uh, policy papers, only about resource conflicts, geopolitics, a Caspian great game or legal uh, dispute, uh, which also uh, gives a negative image about the 
Caspian Sea, that there is only uh, conflict, competition dominates in the region, that five Caspian Sea countries, they don't have agreement about the legal status. That's why they are ready almost to use their uh, naval uh, sources almost. So we can see a lot of exaggerated and uh, overestimated uh, arguments about the Caspian Sea. This also illustrates that uh, external, generally Western uh, academics do not understand the uh, internal dynamics of the Caspian countries. Uh, for example, when I look at the literature, uh, it was argued that Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan and Kazakhstan have small naval forces, uh, but they are increasing their naval forces because of the legal agreement. Uh, these arguments, uh, by the way, were stated before the signing of the legal status. They argued that Iran and Russia on purpose avoiding signing the uh, legal status because they want to prevent uh, development of uh, pipeline uh, construction in the region. And uh, when we look at uh, other arguments, you can see that uh, they describe uncertain legal status a threat to the regional stability that Russia and Iran can use their military forces against newly independent states if they disagree with Iran and uh, Russia. So we can see that relevant literature before the signing of the legal status, they were quite negative. However, when we look at after signing the legal status, we can see that there is nothing uh, changed. So basically, uh, similar arguments uh, were stated uh, after signing the uh, legal status again, but this time uh, geopolitical uh, literature started to use environmental uh, agreements. So when we look at the uh, Caspian legal uh, agreement, we can see it includes several uh, lines about the environmental cooperation and that if someone wants to build a pipeline, uh, those countries need to follow environmental requirements of the legal status. And immediately after signing the agreement, geopolitical literature again started to argue that these environmental uh, articles will give Russia and Iran uh, powerful tools to avoid possible cooperation between Turkmenistan, uh, Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan for uh, constructing a pipeline under the Caspian Sea. They also argued that uh, convention doesn't satisfy the environmental uh, conditions for the construction of the Trans-Caspian uh, Pipeline. Trans-Caspian Pipeline is one of the, uh, let's say, draft projects between uh, Turkmenistan and Azerbaijan uh, to deliver gas to the European Union. Again, your uh, literature Geopolitical literature argued that, well, we see a new a new conflict will emerge among uh, Caspian Sea countries and divided them into two groups. On the one hand, we see Iran and Russia. On the other hand, we will see Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan. So again, a negative image continued after signing the convention. So before it was same after uh, the signing of the agreement, similar arguments followed. So uh, my main argument here is that uh, the relevant literature doesn't understand the history of this legal agreement and they don't know about the history of environmental cooperation. So I use here alternative view to challenge geopolitical uh, discussion and a little bit about the functionalism. Functionalism is a uh, uh, functionalism argues that a shared technical issues such as uh, environmental pollution or uh, construction of, uh, let's say, railways or um, construction of uh, telecommunications, these kind of technical issues are shared among uh, different countries. So considering their technicality, countries can cooperate to solve the common issues. Uh, functionalism also argues that network of different actors are important because each actor can bring their own uh, benefits such as economic, political or um, social uh, contributions. And uh, another view of functionalism is that it is not always zero sum game or uh, geopolitical competition, but it is always, uh, it can also be a win-win game depends on the interest of uh, countries. And finally, functionalism argues that 
collaboration in one field, if we collaborate for the environmental cooperation, we can also uh, move this uh, cooperation example to legal uh, issue as well. So under this uh, theoretical framework, I try to understand relationship between environmental cooperation and legal cooperation. So a little bit about the uh, history of the Caspian environmental program, because this program uh, hasn't been uh, recognized or mentioned by the relevant geopolitical literature. Uh, that's why uh, they don't know uh, why Caspian littoral states include the environmental uh, uh, lines or environmental articles within the legal status. So. Caspian environmental program, overall um, environmental issues uh, were part of the discussion uh, already in the early 1990s. So Iran was the first country, uh, took the first steps uh, to bring five Caspian states together to address the ecological issues, such as pollution of the sea, uh, biological uh, 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 problem with the uh, biological issues, biological resources, and uh, also salty, saltiness of the uh, sea as well, and the increasing level of the Caspian Sea or uh, this unconditional level of the Caspian Sea. So Iran wanted to address these environmental issues together. Uh, it proposed in 1992 uh, to make an ecological cooperation. However, it didn't work out because of two reasons. First, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, and Azerbaijan wanted to explore and transport their oil and uh, gas resources in order to increase their economic budget. So after the 1990s, their first aim was to uh, explore their oil and gas resources. Second aim, uh, Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, and uh, Kazakhstan, they didn't have strong environmental uh, and advanced uh, technical developments. So they needed help from external sources in order to make common agreements, in order to make uh, Western standards, I would say, or the UN standards uh, environmental documents. Therefore, uh, Iran's uh, proposal uh, didn't receive strong support. However, this uh, uh, issue started to change in 1994 uh, by the Almata Declaration. In Almata, five Caspian countries called international community for help. International community here, UNDP, uh, UNEP, World Bank, and Global Environmental Facility. You can also find the report in 1998 that uh, these organizations received invitation directly from the Caspian leaders that help them to address the environmental issues. And here again, I put the timeline to illustrate that uh, legal status timeline and environmental time, uh, cooperation timeline started at the same time. So there is interconnection uh, between these uh, timelines. However, uh, geopolitical literature doesn't know this timeline and they assume that uh, environmental articles suddenly uh, were added by Russia and Iran in uh, 2018 before the uh, signing the legal agreement. So they ignore the history of this environmental cooperation that it is not new, it was already there. And even before the legal agreement already, Caspian environmental program was established and the uh, littoral states were already cooperating and discussing these issues. So when we look at the Caspian environmental program, it was officially uh, established in 1998 by the joint support of the UNDP, UNEP, and the World Bank. Um, this uh, environmental program uh, gained strong support in 2003, uh, which uh, literal states uh, signed the first legal agreement, Tehran Convention. Tehran Convention is the first environmental agreement and also first common agreement, which was signed and ratified in 2006 by five Caspian states. So before the legal agreement, there was already environmental agreement and it was signed and ratified by the five Caspian states. However, when we look at the literature, they don't mention this. Uh, and Tehran Convention uh, has four main protocols. Uh, these protocols 
uh, have been discussed and signed by the littoral states uh, throughout these years until 2018. And the last protocol, the Protocol on Environmental Impact Assessment, was signed in uh, 2018, July, just before the legal status agreement. And when we look at the uh, environmental cooperation, we can see involvement of states, five Caspian states, we can see involvement of uh, intergovernmental organizations, and we can also see involvement of uh, private actors. British Petroleum uh, is among the sponsors of this environmental program, and British Petroleum uh, financially support the uh, Caspian uh, environmental center which shares uh, constantly updates about uh, protocols about any event about the uh, uh, caspian sea i can also share it is link so when we look at this picture we can see that it's not only states but it includes a network of multiple actors together and there is a progressive cooperation towards the uh, legal status and uh, my first main argument is that uh, Caspian littoral states came together uh, because of uh, economic support of the intergovernmental organizations. Uh, I did a field trip interview with uh, several uh, experts from these organizations, and one of the uh, members uh, told me that as long as we pay money, uh, it was easy to convince Caspian littoral states to come together, because environmental issues for them were not too urgent. So they didn't want to invest those issues. However, they also wanted to discuss these issues because it was part of the legal uh, status. So it will influence their legal status. Uh, and in order to push them and pressure these governments, uh, we started to finance them. For example, uh, these organizations have invested more than 20 million uh, for the environmental cooperation. And since they financed the environmental cooperation, they could demand uh, littoral states to sign agreements or to come to meetings and discuss their ecological issues. And uh, well, when we look at the economic perspective, and now we can look at also networking and socialization, uh, one of the important contribution of the Caspian environmental program was uh, networking of different actors. It was, uh, they organized conference of parties and the uh, secretariat uh, organized constantly meetings among different Caspian experts. And again, one of the uh, field trip uh, experts mentioned that in the early 2000s, uh, the relationship between five Caspian states, especially between Iran and Azerbaijan, was cold. Uh, because it was new, we were trying to understand each other and we were trying to uh, understand each other's interests. Therefore, regular meeting under the environmental cooperation eased our uh, discussion. So in the end of 2000, uh, we can see that they established more friendly and more uh, easy relationship. One of the experts even called their uh, expert community as a Caspian family. They said, uh, it doesn't matter our government disagree or agree, uh, they are politicians, but as environmental experts, we try to uh, have a constructive discussion always. And uh, because of uh, common understanding and because of uh, common issues, we try to find also common uh, solution for our issues. And uh, thanks to intergovernmental organizations, we had regular meetings in order to update each other, in order to find agreement, and also, during these meetings, uh, we discuss certain issues under the legal status, because legal status was discussed by the foreign ministers, but here also we could agree certain things and we can deliver this message to our governments. So we can see that it was also helpful. And uh, finally, we can see technical expertise of the intergovernmental organizations. One of the technical expertise here is language. When we look at the discussion documents, I checked all the documents and their uh, meeting minutes, we can see that Caspian governments discussed uh, every uh, sentence, every uh, issue uh, one by one. For example, I did interview with uh, experts from Iran, Kazakhstan, and also uh, Turkmenistan. They said every sentence for us is important. 
we are not uh, signing environmental agreements just for the sake of it, because we know that any environmental sentence can influence our oil and gas exploration. Therefore, we wanted to make sure that in the future we will not get any issue. Again, this is related to the legal status agreement, because when we look at it, it doesn't uh, require strength, uh, strong uh, requirements. So here, Caspian littoral states agreed on these issues. For example, there was a disagreement in 2015, and uh, this disagreement took three years. And it was a disagreement about um, a last protocol. Turkmenistan suggested to remove certain phrases from the agreement. For example, the diameter of the pipeline, environmental uh, exploration of the uh, Caspian Sea. So these two phrases uh, were suggested to be removed from Turkmenistan. However, Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan disagreed and they sent a letter to the United Nations Environmental Secretariat to check whether these sentences or this change will affect the oil and gas exploration. So we can see that, uh, well, every word, every sentence were agreed in advance. And in the end, Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan uh, pushed their own interest in the environmental discussion and avoid uh, any serious issues. And uh, I created this uh, chain and I argue that environmental cooperation is related to the legal status because first it started with the Caspian Environmental Program in 1995. Then it moved to Tehran Convention as a first uh, agreement among the Caspian states. And Tehran Convention facilitated discussion of four environmental pro uh, protocols. And uh, when Caspian littoral states realized that their cooperation actually is moving forward. They also moved other areas as well. And the second common document was signed among the Caspian littoral states and it's called Caspian Security Agreement. This was also uh, signed before the legal status. And finally, legal status was signed in 2018. So my main argument here is that uh, Caspian Environmental Program uh, was already there. It facilitated the uh, discussion of other issues. And legal status, we should see a big umbrella. And this umbrella can be divided into small parts. And throughout this 30 years discussion, Caspian littoral states try to address all these parts one by one, not as a package. So they try to do a step-by-step -step approach to the legal status agreement. Therefore, when we look at the future uh, projects such as Trans-Caspian Pipeline, environmental issues are not main, environmental requirements are not main challenge because Russia already uh, constructed a Nord Stream Pipeline uh, under sea pipeline from Russia to Europe. So Russia already complied and knows that environmental uh, requirements can be addressed. Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, and Turkmenistan are also uh, aware of these uh, challenges. I remember uh, when Baku Tbilisi Jehan pipeline uh, was planned, environmental requirements were also issued. However, they couldn't prevent the construction of the Baku Tbilisi Jehan pipeline because of financial support from the in, in international companies. So again, uh, for the Trans-Caspian pipeline, there are a number of challenges. First, Turkmenistan uh, policy of gas transport is different than Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan. According to this policy, uh, buyer should build and should finance the transport and the construction of pipelines. However, Azerbaijan and European Union are right now struggling with their own economic issues. So they need strong support. And my argument here is that in order to build the pipeline, first thing is beyond legal and environmental issues is strong financial support. Who will finance this pipeline? Second, uh, again, when we look at the European companies, they are not part of uh, Turkmenistan energy projects. They are not super active in Turkmenistan. Uh, Turkmenistan mainly uh, exports to Russia and China. Right now, China dominates uh, within the Turkmen energy, uh, let's say, uh, area. Therefore, first, European companies also need to find 
attractive market. Uh, Turkmen market should be attractive and uh, reliable for the European companies. When we look at the uh, energy projects, especially in Azerbaijan, British Petroleum dominates almost all the energy uh, projects and their strong financial support facilitates this uh, construction. Without them, it doesn't matter even if Russia and Iran says, let's build the pipeline, we need still uh, technology from the uh, energy companies. And finally, Azerbaijan first want to deliver its own natural resources to uh, Europe, because yes, it is not that much, it cannot uh, satisfy European uh, energy demand, but first Azerbaijan wants to deliver the European, uh, first wants to deliver its own natural resources. Therefore, after Azerbaijan delivers its own, uh, Azerbaijan probably will look for alternative sources, but right now it is not the case. Therefore, Transcaspian pipeline is not, and I don't think will be uh, blocked by Russia or Iran because of the environmental uh, requirements. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, attention. And uh, that was all for my presentation. And I hope it wasn't uh, too complex and confusing. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bayramov. It was a very illuminating uh, presentation, I think. Uh, and the environmental aspects so far have somewhat um, ignored, uh, to some extent at least, from some of the outsider world. So it is very important to firmly ground the environmental pillar in the whole edifice of this uh, Caspian uh, geopolitics or uh, more friendly saying Caspian family, maybe, uh, as yes. one uh, spectator uh, rightfully commented. Uh, I, I think there are many questions um, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the spectators can ask, but uh, I am wondering if still environment is not uh, an urgent issue for the Caspian littoral states or not. I mean, this uh, climate change a uh, speedily uh, approaching phenomenon for all the countries in the world. As you have mentioned just before the uh, presentation, uh, this uh, sea level rises or sea level changes and maybe extreme events in Caspian uh, basin can be a, a more imminent threat than uh, the uh, previous years. So uh, is there any are there any studies related to these type of new challenges related to climate change or new environmental challenges uh, for the Caspian region? This is one of uh, my questions. Another thing is that, uh, do you have idea that uh, environmental agreements are generally called as a soft law? Uh, so they are sometimes not binding or even if they are binding, uh, states are refrained from uh, implementing them fully uh, in strict terms. So is there same uh, issue in, in, in Caspian Basin uh, overall? And one uh, final uh, question can be, if uh, I'm not going too far, uh, the European Union, um, as you well know, uh, started uh, a project or a new approach called macro regions macro regions, uh, some uh, experts call them as a new political uh, animal, actually, a macro region concept. Uh, for example, the Baltic region, the, the, the Danube region. Uh, so uh, getting together around a, a specific topic or a specific common overarching uh, geographical um, element uh, countries in, in European Union, these uh, uh, sharing common uh, challenges come together around uh, especially flagship projects, like, for example, uh, the increasing the efficiency of navigation in, in the Danube or uh, dealing with the pollution in uh, the Baltic Sea, etc. So uh, do you think that such kind of an approach, so project-based, flagship project-based, approach can be also implemented in uh, Caspian uh, region. So instead of, for example, 
status or uh, dealing with the words, uh, you know, uh, maneuvering, etc. So rather, can we focus or can states focus on concrete um, projects, yeah. clearer timelines, uh, targets, strategic papers or action plans? Uh, is this a possibility for the region, uh, given the uh, long history of negotiations and uh, somewhat uh, relatively uh, peaceful atmosphere in the region compared to some other parts of the globe? Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for these uh, questions and uh, very good points. Uh, my first answer for the climate change um, and the environmental issues, uh, Overall, my personal observation and based on my field trip and when I talk to the uh, government officials and when I look at their policy is that uh, except Iran, uh, generally they don't too much care about the environmental issues. It's not their priority. So it is one of the issues. But when you look at the uh, when, if you list them. Uh, top 10 priorities, probably environmental issues and uh, influence of climate change would end up uh, in the lower level uh, issue. So it's not main issue. And uh, since uh, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan are energy dependent, and this energy is coming from uh, mainly from the Caspian Sea, they prefer exploration of natural resources. So, uh, maybe under the certain uh, environmental uh, requirements. And unfortunately, uh, when I look at the Caspian environmental program, you can see that almost every document, every study uh, have been supervised or financed or written by the intergovernmental organizations. Uh, there are several uh, reports from United Nations, uh, several reports from the Global Environmental Facility, but uh, country itself is missing. A basic example from Azerbaijan, I checked their ministry's website. It's not always update. And the one time uh, expert from the United Nations told me that environmental ministries within these countries are not super powerful politically. Uh, compared to foreign ministers, uh, they are uh, missing uh, pressure to put pressure to the government to accept certain decisions. Therefore, yes, they accept all these uh, rules, as you said, soft power, uh, but they don't implement uh, environmental agreements. So they sign it uh, They in, uh, in order to uh, move forward uh, with certain uh, agreements and uh, to avoid, uh, let's say, political issues based on these agreements. Uh, but implementation, unfortunately, is not there. And it's also good that it is a soft power. It means they can agree easily on uh, certain issues that they are more flexible. And they can also learn from this and move forward with uh, less, uh, let's say, technical issues. And uh, when you look at the implementation, uh, they more care about here a financial uh, assistance from intergovernmental organizations. And also they more care about um, to avoid any uh, agreement that will avoid their uh, natural resource exploration. Uh, European uh, macro regions project uh, is very good. And uh, however, when we look at the uh, Caspian Sea, we can see that Iran and Russia uh, have been under the international sanctions lot. So that also prevents uh, five Caspian states to cooperate together. Uh, again, one of the uh, financial institutions, Global uh, Environmental Facility, stop financing uh, this kind of flagship projects and uh, decrease their uh, financial assistance uh, because of the international sanctions. Uh, they said United States is one of the sponsors for the financial institutions. And since United States put uh, pressure and sanction Iran and uh, Russia, we cannot finance flagship projects anymore. And this uh, finance should come from the Caspian states itself. Uh, however, when I, uh, when I look at the budget allocation for this program, it doesn't move more than seven, uh, $75,000 uh, per year. Uh, that's, for example, quite a less amount. Uh, 
and a few times they discussed to increase the budget, but they haven't moved uh, yeah, forward. So they expect money comes from outside and we implement all the projects. And when I look at the purpose of this cooperation, it is not a per se uh, to achieve uh, something umbrella uh, cooperation like European Union. Their purpose is just to come together under less political issues and to experience also dialogue between each other because to keep contact with uh, five Caspian countries uh, is very important. And to make this constant, you need to find a platform that they are not fighting, they are not disagreeing and leaving the room. And legal status, unfortunately, is very high level discussion with presidents and minister of foreign affairs. So disagreement can easily happen there. But uh, environmental discussion is placed where they can experience first cooperation under the soft powers, as you said, and then they can say, OK, let's take this uh, another level. I remember there was a diplomat who mentioned that uh, we always ask Minister of Foreign Affairs to attend our meetings to see how friendly the discussion is going on. So they can also, from the foreign ministry, uh, ask their questions and highlight their positions under a bit soft environment rather than strict legal discussion. So I think uh, regional cooperation is possible. However, global issues also influence it. As I said, sanctions, uh, right now COVID, and uh, before that, uh, uh, economic crisis. So it also influenced uh, financial assistance to the regional projects. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for your answers. Um, any other comments or questions from the participants? There are some close to 20 participants. I'd like to ask something, may I? Yes. Uh, well, thanks for the presentation. Uh, yeah, uh, my question is, don't you think that um, the fact that uh, in, um, environmental issues are not uh, considered as they should uh, in case of Caspian Sea. Uh, don't you think that the reason for this is that um, the countries around that, that surround the Caspian Sea is, uh, are, um, are, are countries with poor levels of democracy and the decision-making process is, uh, uh, is, is done through poor institutions and uh, to, to uh, and to which extent we can say that uh, the interests that, that are being pushed by these countries are um, are the interests of of the of the countries uh, of the peoples uh, of these of these countries. Can we compare this case with uh, other cases, for example, uh, well, cross border lakes uh, like Great Lakes between the United States and Canada? Or in Africa, we have uh, Lake Victoria surrounded by three states, I think. And um, what's what's the role of um, in, uh, the quality of institutions uh, in decision making? Uh, I just I'd like to, uh, to hear the just uh, general thoughts on this. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. Uh, very good point uh, in terms of comparative and quality of uh, institutions. I would say uh, they change. Uh, uh, both, uh, I mean, the five Caspian countries, they have a different and I would say slightly poor uh, 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 quality of institutions. Uh, for example, uh, Minister of Environmental Affairs, uh, uh, they are not uh, well organized. And we also need to look at internal uh, issues as well. Uh, rule of democracy, free elections, that's also missing in these countries. And I remember uh, one of the Iranian experts mentioned that in order to have one change uh, within the document, they need to ask permission from high level uh, uh, ministries, parliament members uh, to uh, come back and say uh, during the meetings, okay, we want to change this. So uh, because of the poor quality of uh, institutions and low profile of environmental ministries and also highly, uh, let's say, powerful rule of foreign affairs, decision-making within this soft, let's say, cooperation was not easy. And another point is uh, interest of people 
uh, are not priority for these five Caspian countries. Uh, when we look at, uh, as you said, um, environmental cooperation between Canada and the United States, even environmental cooperation within the European Union, uh, that's one of my uh, theoretical framework, is that they consider the uh, interest of the people as well. For example, when you make uh, uh, environmental cooperation or any technical cooperation, first thing you uh, assume how our citizens will benefit from this. However, uh, when we look at the environmental cooperation among the Caspian countries, we can see uh, citizens' uh, interests or their issues are not priority. Priority here is how we can make sure that environmental cooperation will not damage our uh, economic interests and will not damage our oil and gas uh, exploration rather than uh, a problem among the coastal uh, areas because coastal cities uh, in Iran, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, they are the main uh, vulnerable places. Uh, so we see, for example, the rule of cities here. Uh, instead of uh, states, instead of environmental ministries, uh, I would say uh, city mayors from uh, coastal areas should also participate and express their main problems. However, we miss here local initiatives. Uh, local uh, NGOs are missing. One of the problem here, they don't include non-governmental institutions. Uh, in the beginning 2000, uh, there were some non-governmental institutions. However, for example, in the case of Azerbaijan, to open and facilitate foreign non-governmental institutions are restricted. So uh, Western or foreign NGOs cannot freely, uh, let's say, function within Baku. Therefore, we miss here objective and critical uh, assessment of NGOs. And uh, therefore, a very good point when we compare it with more developed and more serious, uh, let's say, environmental cooperations, we can clearly see here uh, rule and voice of people, citizens. Uh, for example, fishing uh, uh, industry is more active than uh, fishing, uh, let's say, citizens, th those citizens that are doing a fishing business. Locals, their income uh, is mainly uh, coming from the Caspian Sea, maybe from tourism, maybe from a uh, fishing industry. However, their voice uh, are not represented. This also illustrates that, well, uh, littoral states uh, do not care about environmental issues. And their main here purpose is to make sure that uh, we are not uh, deadlocked in that area. We move forward while considering our own high interests. That's why they also, when international organizations left the region, they also don't increase uh, uh, environmental budget. They have limited budget and they, have, uh, they don't uh, want to increase this budget as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, any further questions, comments? Uh, if not, I have one uh, uh, idea or a question in my mind. Uh, uh, I am wondering what uh, what is the most threatened uh, region of Caspian Sea in terms of uh, climate change or sea level changes or air, any other environmental threat? For example, uh, I mean, Iran, as you mentioned, I think Iran, environmental issues are uh, high on the agenda, mm -hmm. interestingly, because it is a uh, oil producing country uh, and it has been under the impact of uh, sanctions. Uh, as I remember, during the uh, Paris climate talks, environmental ministry of Iran was also very active. Mm -hmm. so is, the, is there any specific reason for, uh, I mean, Iran, will Iran be one of the most heavily affected country in terms of environmental problems in the Caspian Sea? As far as I know, it's, uh, it's a mountainous area and the, the, the Iranian coast. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, intuitively, I'm thinking that uh, Kazakhstan's or Turkmenistan's and also Russian's uh, cities can be affected most because of the topography, but uh, you can illuminate us better, of course. I, I would say a very good point is that uh, pollution is the main issue, sea pollution, because of the natural resource exploration. 
And this pollution, uh, I would say from the, uh, in Azerbaijan, comes from a national oil company. I did interview uh, with a British Petroleum and they blamed constantly national oil company of Azerbaijan. And they said, uh, this company doesn't use high level technology when they explore. And when we look at the statistics of accidents, oil uh, leakage in, the, in Azerbaijan, we can see that British Petroleum, uh, they, they didn't experience too much uh, pollution uh, issues. However, uh, National Oil Company, they have uh, old, outdated platforms, and they are using very outdated technology in certain areas, and uh, it causes a lot of uh, pollution. And uh, yes, as you said, Iran is very active because Iran doesn't have a strong oil uh, and gas resources in the uh, Caspian part of the Iran. Therefore, they are more concerned about the fishing and pollution of the sea. And same thing we can also argue for, the, uh, for Russia as well, compared to other regions, because both Russia and Iran are rich uh, with natural resources. Uh, Caspian Sea are not uh, active at least the main parts of the Caspian Sea under Iran and uh, uh, Russia are not uh, full of uh, oil and gas. They have certain amount, but it's not commercially, uh, let's say, viable to explore it. Therefore, Iran prefers to use it as uh, Gulf uh, area uh, resources to uh, transport from that uh, places. And uh, very funny thing is uh, during the Paris uh, climate discussion and when you look at the, when you look at the document, all these uh, Caspian countries are part of it. They sign it, and I think the main reason uh, here is diplomatic that they don't want to look uh, internationally that they are against climate change or they don't believe it, and they also want to do it uh, because they want to show financial institutions and intergovernmental institutions that they follow norms and values. Uh, of the international community and I think they signed the agreement just for the sake of it not to be isolated uh, it doesn't mean that for example in Europe in the Netherlands uh, there is a strong uh, climate change measures for the oil gas even highways uh, they are implementing a lot of uh, things to reach their uh, European level climate target However, when we look at Azerbaijan, I don't think there is a target. I, uh, I am not uh, aware of the Kazakhstan yet, but I also don't think Kazakhstan has a target uh, or high level target to address the climate change. Very low level target and these targets are not very, uh, uh, let's say, strongly implemented. Uh, for example, when you look at Azerbaijan, it's part of climate change. However, electric city, electric energy is coming from mainly oil and gas rather than renewable energy. So they, their investment uh, to the renewable energy is also very low. And they just started uh, yeah, a few years ago uh, for the renewable energy. So therefore, I think idea of climate change and pollution, uh, they sign it just to be part of it, not to be isolated and be part of the community in the international arena and also show their financial assets that we are part of it because uh, when azerbaijan uh, started southern gas corridor there were a lot of ngos uh, sending letter to uh, financial institutions that uh, this country uh, doesn't implement environmental requirements and European Bank for Reconstruction and Development uh, required from Azerbaijan and British Petroleum to send them environmental reports, in environmental assessments. So we can see that they do it in order to make sure that financial uh, sponsorship will continue and they will not have any, let's say, unexpected issues. Thank you. Very interesting because uh, they seek a balance between uh, financing, uh, prestige, uh, norms, international norms, and uh, also natural resources exploration. A very similar uh, story for most of the developing countries, I guess. Um, exactly. Yeah. Albina Muratbekova's uh, question from our institute. Uh, Dr. Muratbekova asks, uh, she says, thank you very much for your presentation, very informative. I am wondering, is there any research center that works collectively with all stakeholders on researching the environmental issues of Caspian Sea. I mean, is there any research initiative that works on scientific collaboration 
in researching the environmental issues between five states? Uh, very good question. Uh, uh, one of the, I would, there is no specific institution only for the environment, but uh, Azerbaijan Diplomacy Academy, they recently opened a certain department, uh, environmental cooperation uh, of the uh, Caspian Sea countries. Uh, I can send uh, that link. It is Center for Environmental Studies, I think it's called. Uh, I also uh, wrote for them a policy paper but that uh, institution uh, doesn't only research environmental issues, but also renewable energy, oil, gas exploration. So in Azerbaijan, I know that Azerbaijan Diplomacy Academy is busy with this. Mm -hmm. uh, in Europe, uh, unfortunately, only few individual researchers like you, like me, uh, separated. So there is no one center that works particularly on environmental issues. And uh, there are only researchers work on a project base. So there is also one project, but that project covers uh, not environment, but overall Caspian Sea. I can send also the uh, project uh, website to you. It's a Maria Curie web uh, uh, project on uh, uh, Caspian Sea. Uh, other than that, I would say mainly intergovernmental institutions uh, work on it. Uh, United Nations uh, constantly publish reports uh, on uh, Caspian Sea, especially uh, about the climate change, environmental uh, resources. Uh, however, there is no scientific collaboration between different stakeholders. So it would also be great initiative for your institute to open uh, or to facilitate this collaboration. It doesn't have to be maybe based in Kazakhstan, but uh, your institution can be a leading uh, research area uh, to address this and I think there is also room for applying grants uh, because of the climate change uh, we can move uh, more climate change direction how climate change will influence the Caspian sea level and pollution and coastal areas and I'm sure European projects would facilitate maybe a small flagship uh, let's say grant for this that's right, that's right. I think uh, we should focus more on these issues, definitely. There's a lot of potential for cooperation, for dialogue, at least. And it, it brings uh, to my mind a specific, uh, a, a similar initiative, I mean, uh, that probably uh, Dr. Murat Beko was uh, asking about some kind of initiative like this. In Euphrates and Tigris, uh, two uh, transboundary rivers in the uh, Middle East, uh, there was a there was an initiative by uh, a group of scientists, uh, like an epistemic community. Uh, it is called Ethic Euph Euphrates Tigris Initiative for Cooperation. So it was a track to uh, diplomacy. So uh, officials are uh, coming together and discussing, negotiating with each other, the officials, etc. But this is a, a separate. Uh, initiative, but also feeding the officials in terms of creating databases, uh, new uh, models, new scenarios, uh, publications, etc. It was a very loose uh, organization, or even not an organization, but an initiative. But maybe a similar group of scientists, maybe uh, from all literal states, can come together and uh, and organize workshops, etc. Can publish some um, papers to, to direct the agenda or the channel uh, some uh, ideas towards the bureaucracies and towards the decision makers. Uh, yes, I can... think uh, it can start as maybe a handbook, uh, I would say, or yeah. a route which, uh, uh, yes. series as well. Uh, for example, uh, someone from Azerbaijan, someone from Kazakhstan, and then you... Uh, make this, uh, let's say, Radlich book only for the Caspian Sea countries. Mm -hmm. And it can include uh, renewable energy, climate change in order to make it uh, marketing. Unfortunately, publications should also address a marketing requirements because uh, maybe the topic is interesting. And if a publication company sees that, well, it is a bit outdated topic and uh, it only concentrates on 
uh, let's say fishing stocks mm -hmm. they will might uh, not support us but if they see okay climate change and uh, uh, other environmental issues uh, are included uh, i think we can establish uh, or maybe suggest a panel and then move with the radlich uh, series yes. and then this can be also used as a handbook for the politicians or uh, uh, practitioners uh, within the ministry of environment it would be perfect. It would be a, a great, uh, I think, uh, suggestion. Uh, I mean, if you agree, we can work work more on this uh, suggestion. Uh, not maybe a series at first, but start with a single book, and then maybe it can evolve into a series. In exactly. Yes, yeah, single. Yeah, single edited volume. Yes. Uh, or a, sp a small special issue or report, maybe. Uh, yes to make also this region, I would say, popular a bit, because mm -hmm. my impression is that um, yeah, outsiders only care about uh, geopolitics. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. They care only about Russia and Iran, their political influence there, and China these days, uh, rather than uh, internal issues or internal developments. That's right. Uh, that's right. Yeah, that's uh, that's unfortunately one of the disadvantages. Uh, so we yeah. need to make sure that it also influences geopolitics, maybe. Yeah. Uh, so tourism can be a, a, a point in this uh, trade, uh, of course, and climate change, as you said, and renewable energy. So yeah. four new areas or under discussed areas can be yes. four thematic headings in such a book. Uh, I yes, I, I know in Norway, Norway is very active. In Norway, there is an institution, uh, it's called NUPI. Uh, mm. This institution uh, uh, is also active uh, with this kind of stuff. I can also uh, write the name of the expert. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, the expert. Uh, he's very active uh, for the Central Asia. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can maybe invite him uh, one time uh, for uh, a seminar. Uh, this yeah, guy yeah, is yeah. very active uh, for the Central Asian affairs. Mm -hmm. And he's doing Center for Energy Research and uh, is more looking for uh, sustainable energy, sustainable transition. Mm -hmm. uh, and he has a lot of publications about uh, Central Asia as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's fantastic. Yes, we can uh, maybe come together and involving this guy also and, yeah. uh, create a, some kind of editorial group to uh, expand the network and uh, attract some chapters. Exactly. They are very active and I think they have also a uh, center mm -hmm. about Central Asia, which... Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so yes, OEC Bishkek Academy is also very active, I would say. Bishkek Academy, interesting. Yeah, Bishkek, Bishkek Academy, yes. Uh, okay. I will send you now a link as well. Uh, they are also very active in terms of financing and the writing. So, this mm. is the oh, OEC. Oh, okay, okay, I got it. Yeah, I was thinking about what is the relation between Bishkek and the Caspian Sea, but yes, all the Central Asia. So they are, they are more uh, Central Asian aspect and look at all the dimensions there. So they exactly. might also be useful collaborator. That's right. That's right. So if you agree, I will uh, at least uh, get into contact with, with uh, Indra Overland and I will also CC you uh, yes. talking about such a project, maybe. Uh, yeah, that would be nice. Yes, we can uh, move follow up and uh, in the future unfortunately covid uh, doesn't allow to travel in between it would be nice to visit your institute as well and uh, meet all of you there in person yes we would have invited you for sure but uh, you are still in our minds and as soon as this covid uh, appears or uh, allows us to uh, move more freely i will definitely uh, get into contact you for this purpose, for sure, yeah. Okay, any other questions? Probably we have come to, uh, you have eliminated us uh, more than we can expect probably. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for your uh, kind uh, joining us today. And on behalf of the Eurasian Research Institute of Hoca Ahmet Yesevi, International uh, Turkish Kazakh University, 
I send you our warm greetings from Almaty and uh, hope to meet you again uh, yes. as soon as possible. In the near Thank you very much. Thank you very much for also having me today. It was great pleasure to present my work and I appreciate your interest as well. And I hope uh, this will be the beginning of our cooperation uh, for sure with different scholars. And in case in the future, if you organize an uh, event, uh, uh, I have a bit heavy teaching activities, but if I have a time, I would love to also listen and uh, engage and continue the cooperation. Thank you. We would be more than happy to involve you in our uh, circles. And I have sent you uh, my WhatsApp number. If you send a message there, I will also uh, involve you our some kind of news list. Uh, okay. uh, and so that we can be more uh, in touch. Great. Thank you so much. Thank have a so nice much. day. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.